So, um, so what do we mean by squaring the life curve? I think that's the first thing that we need to address with this. So when I first started um, working with uh, especially the nursing faculty at the university, and you can see here we have many clinical collaborators represented, they talked about the typical trajectory of aging for seniors is in a sort of stair-step pattern as shown here in the red curve. You'll go along on a plateau for a while until something dramatic happens and then you get knocked down to the next level until the next big thing happens. So our hypothesis was if we could recognize the beginning of that decline or better yet predict when that decline was likely to occur, we could go in with an appropriate intervention to prevent a large decline and keep people up at that high level. And so what we're trying to do is literally square the life curve. We're not necessarily asserting that we're going to extend somebody's lifespan, but we, what we want to do is improve and extend someone's health span. That is, keep them up at a healthy level for as long as possible. So we're doing that by a system of in-home sensors that function as a clinical decision support system. So what's represented here that I'm gonna talk about today are the sensors that we're currently using. Over the years, we've tested many different kinds of sensors. These are the ones that we think give you the most bang for your buck. That is, it give you the most clinically relevant type of information that allows us to detect very, very early signs of health changes so that we can, in fact, go in with early, early interventions. So the system is patented and licensed to Foresight Healthcare, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. We automatically recognize when health changes occur. We send out health alerts, as well as uh, fall alerts in real time that are sent to the nurses and the social workers. So this work started out in Tiger Place. This is a local facility, of course, named after our mascot at the university. Uh, 54 apartments. It's an interesting um, partnership between a private corporation, AmeriCare, and a state university. It was built and is operated by AmeriCare. Um, the, when it opened in 2004, um, the nursing school was running all of the clinical care component. And so the care model is really something that the nursing school has established. And it was built to function as a living laboratory. Additional assessments are collected there so that we can run experiments. Not only did the nurses want to see the effect of different care models, but they also wanted to then be able to test the effectiveness of the technology. So we're able to do that. So we've tested over the years then, we were able to show that Tiger Place residents could in fact stay at Tiger Place 1.7 years longer on average with the sensors in place and the early health alerts uh, compared to those living at Tiger Place that did not have the sensors. So that shows that we have been able to be effective in, in being able to keep people up at that high level of functionality. So I'm gonna show you a little bit about some of the sensors that we're using. Uh, this one shows the depth sensor. Now, from what I mean by a depth sensor is something that produces a depth image, but instead of giving you a uh, color image or a grayscale image, you get a distance to the nearest object. And so we extract out the silhouette of the person walking through the scene, which gives us shape information. People think that that helps preserve the privacy. Nobody wants streaming video in your home, but they're willing to accept this sort of three-dimensional silhouette that gives you shape. And so from that, we can get lots of different gait information, and we also do fall detection. So here's an example of somebody walking in the scene. Then on the right, I'll show you um, how we process and pull out trends of gait data. So each one of those dots in that graph represents an extracted walk, and in particular, what we might call a purposeful walk, a walk that clearly is meant to go from point A to point B in the home, and we extract that out and we capture walking speed and stride time and stride length, 
and in height, and uh, we look for clusters in that sensor data feature space, one cluster per resident, and we track the centers of those clusters over time so we can see trends in the gate parameters. Here in this scene, you can see we've got two clusters for two residents, and the outliers are the visitors, including those short people over there that were all the grandchildren. So we can track this over time. We've also been able to show now that if there is a decrease in walking speed of five centimeters a second over seven days, there is a 80% probability of falling within the next three weeks. So that gives you a small window of time where you can go in with an intervention to try and prevent that fall in the first place. So you can see this example here. There was a decline in the walking speed and in, when an increase in fall risk, and thus a fall occurred. And this shows you the corresponding increase in fall risk that's occurred. So we have a way of actually uh, converting that average in-home walking speed into a fall risk, and here it's literally uh, converted into what's called the timed up and go, which is a standardized fall risk assessment that is used by the physical therapists and the nurses and other clinicians. And so you can see that fall risk, and you can see here that this person is actually in the high fall risk category. So I'm gonna show you the fall that resulted from that. So I think you can see what that looks like. When we send out the fall alert, we include a link to the depth video so somebody can click on it and they can see what happened. So if there happens to be a false alarm, you can also see that too. Sometimes little children come into the scene and throw themselves on the floor. Those are sort of fun to watch. This is not so fun to watch. Um, I know this case really well because this was my father. He was living in Tiger Place at the time um, luckily, he didn't get hurt, but um, it generated a fall alert. You know, I got it on my phone, and uh, my husband and I went running over there right away. And of course, the Tiger Place staff were there too. But I go run, we go running into Dad's apartment, and he's, you know, he's looking at me. By that time, he'd already gotten up. He was sitting in his chair, and he's looking at me like, "What are you doing here?" <laughs> and I said, "Dad, you fell." And he says to me, oh, you saw that. <laughs> I said, yeah, Dad, I saw that. Remember the depth camera over there? And, I, and so I showed him what it looked like. Well, he was complaining about his neck hurting shortly after that. So I took him to the doctor. Well, the first thing that they ask you when you take a 97-year-old to the doctor is, have you fallen lately? I said, yes. He fell on at 9.02 p.m. on August 12th, and here's the video, you know, and I'm showing in my phone. So the, uh, the doctor looked at it very carefully, um, and as a result of this, you know, they did an X-ray on his neck. Um, he gave us some very careful symptoms to look for to see if there might be some worsening conditions. So it was, it was actually good to see that they could use this not only for detecting the falls, getting people help if they need it, but also then for being able to determine whether there should be some appropriate follow-up treatments made. So let's switch gears a second and look at the bed sensor. This is a hydraulic bed sensor that was developed by one of our PhD students here. And it captures the ballistic cardiogram and the respiration. So the respiration is that higher amplitude, lower frequency signal. The ballistic cardiogram is the uh, lower amplitude, higher frequency signal that's embedded in that. And the ballistic cardiogram is the mechanical effect of the blood flowing through the body as a result of our cardiovascular blood flow. It does not require any on-body uh, contact. And so we can have this transducer underneath the mattress, no contact whatsoever, and we can capture that signal. So you can get respiration, you can get heart rate, uh, and you can get sleep stages. So that allows us to track sleep and, and other vital signs when people are sleeping. Um, we're also looking at what else we can get out of this. And we're working with uh, Giovanna Gudiboni, 
um, who has developed this cardiovascular model, closed loop cardiovascular model, that is um, generating the physiological ballistic cardiogram. And we are using that now to study the waveform of the ballistic cardiogram and see what else we can get from this totally non-invasive type of sensor, including tracking um, how people may have changes in the heart valve function, what type of heart failure they have, and being able to, to track changes in that, and also being able to track changes in blood pressure completely non-invasively. So these health alerts that I mentioned get generated as a basically a change detection. We recognize what's a normal pattern for an individual, and those patterns then turn out to be clusters in the sensor data feature space, and we look for outliers for those clusters. So one of the things that we found is that these people tend to form different clusters over time depending on what their baseline health condition is. And so we needed a little bit more sophisticated algorithm. So this is one, one of our students um, has uh, recently developed with Jim Keller. It's a streaming clustering algorithm, and it allows us to track this data over time. So this represents four plus years worth of data, and you can see there are several clusters that were formed over this period of time as their health condition had changed. But again, we can now look through that sensor data feature space and look for even earlier signs of health changes by looking for consistent movement towards the edge of the cluster even before it actually gets to the edge. So um, we've, we started out by having these sort of nudges on the uh, health alerts where you simply uh, produce something that says to the clinicians, there's something going on, take a closer look. Now we've generated these linguistic style um, health alerts so we can explain in sentence form what's happening. This is an example of one of our students that did this. So this is work also with Jim Keller and Mihail Popescu. And then we've added that with this other cool thing, another one of our um, brilliant uh, PhD students has, in fact, um, he had a poster today. Uh, so this is sequenced data and being able to recognize activity sequences. And then what we're doing with this is that we're taking in this sensor data. We're saying, okay, I got an alert today. Now we're going to go look for other previous days in which we also had an alert. And we're going to see what happened on, that other, on those other days that look similar in terms of the sensor data what happened that generated that alert, that alert previously. And it also uses some of the NLM tools to be able to pull out the semantic types and these clinically unique IDs that are generated so that it can give you some kind of an information about what's going on. And so here's what you get. So here's an alert summary. It says, um, you know, yesterday nighttime bathroom activity was significantly lower than usual. You know, there's some trends that are also given. And previously, this pattern was associated with these conditions. So we're using all of this information now in new consumer interfaces. We're exploring how this can be pushed to the consumers themselves, the older adults and their family members. We've got an, a an Amazon Echo Show that we started deploying in the homes of consumers. And you can at, literally ask your personal health assistant, um, how am I sleeping? What is my fall risk? And it not only gives you a graph, but also gives you a sentence that describes it. So research questions to sort of wrap it up. What information is clinically relevant? This is an ongoing question. What kind of sensors should we be using? What type of parameters should we be extracting from that? How can we detect very early health changes? Um, it really comes down to recognizing noisy sensor data streams and being able to extract imper uh, being able to extract patterns of individuals in these noisy streams. And then how can we facilitate early interventions? How do we display the information? And to whom do we display the information? And can we actually provide appropriate action? That's what we're working on now. 
So many collaborators involved uh, from a lot of different disciplines. Here's George Cronus, who's the CEO of Foresight Healthcare, the company that has licensed our IP and commercialized it. George is an MU alum. He's hired many other MU alums, so it's this little MU community now. And I'd like to just uh, close by thanking all the people involved, all the faculty, the students, the senior participants, and certainly the funding agencies. So thank you very much. <laughs>